We find ourselves this morning in Genesis chapter 4. So we continue with our series in Genesis chapter 1 to 11. So, so far we've seen and we uh, studied Genesis 1 and 2. God created everything and it was good. It was very, very good. Um, so what we, what we saw in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what we really learned was who God is. God is the beginning of everything. He created everything and everyone and just by his words. So we talked about this. So we learn who God is. God is the center of the universe, of everything. And then we also, in Genesis 1, but in Genesis 2 in particular, we, we learn what our place is as humanity in his creation. So God is the center. Then he creates everything and he gives submission and, and he calls us to subdue his creation on planet Earth. So this is our place under God. But everything else we are meant in a way to subdue, to multiply, to, to live for his glory and his honor. And then chapter 3, last Sunday, we looked at the thing, the fact that everything came tumbling down. And we kind of saw the fall of humanity. Adam and Eve fall in sin like we are now sinners. And now we're entering chapter 4. And though even though everything came tumbling down you straightway read encouragement as well because God's plan, He right at the moment where everything breaks, God sees everything broken and yet he gives hope. We, we saw that the gospel was already kind of preached in Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 4, we see, okay, Genesis chapter 3 was the kind of the fall of humanity. Chapter 4 is going to be maybe a little bit more closer and personal. We're kind of going to look at the fall of the family. Family and relational issues, I've uh, given it a title for, for this morning, because we're going to look at the story of Cain and Abel. So everything came tumbling, tumbling down, the whole creation was kind of broken, and now we see and now we experience the kind of the brunt and the consequences in this, in our relationships and in our family relations. Now, maybe, I don't know, I think, uh, I don't know, but you we have lots of internationals here, right? Maybe you fled from your family. <laughs> Who knows? I, I don't know all your stories. But maybe maybe for some, this will relate really, really close. You think, yes, yes, finally, I made it to Eindhoven. Uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm free. You know, but maybe it's because of family and relational issues, which is part of the brokenness of the sinful things in this world now. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to delve into the story of Cain and Abel. Now, let's just start with the first five verses in chapter 4, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit and see what, what we can learn from there. So, what we read there. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. You know, very good, you would, you would say and think. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Let's, let's stop here so far. Okay, so... What we see here is both brothers bring offerings to the Lord. Now, before we kind of delve into this, we, we kind of first need to understand that since the fall of, of sin, sin, since the creation has fallen, every single person, including you and me, we are born now with a sinful <laughs> nature. If you read Romans chapter 3, Psalm 51, Ephesians chapter 2, we, it, it, it clarifies it and, it and it repeats it in a way for us to make it clear. We are born with a sinful nature and we all, this is me, you, everyone, we need to be born again. We need to have a new forgiven heart, otherwise we will, be in, we will stay in this broken and fractured state. So we, we read about this born again, uh, uh, in a way, concept and, and that God is doing this. For example, in John chapter 1, it says, Therefore, to all 
who did receive him, who believed in his name, which is Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, in other passages, in, in uh, John chapter 3, it talks about being born again as well. So the concept is, we, we need to understand it from the, from the beginning. We are born with a sinful nature, not with a good heart, not as a good person. You might think that the, 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 uh, the world will tell you that, that we deep down we're, we're good persons, just follow your dream and, and you're a good person. You know, look deep in, in your heart. Well, the deeper you look in your heart, the Bible tells you the darker it gets. This is the reality. And this heart needs to be born again, not of man, not of dreams, not of uh, Disney, not of, no, from God, of God. That's the only remedy. So, and we all need this. And Cain and Abel also, they also need this. But we, what, what we see here with Cain and Abel is that, and, and in the first instance when you look at it, you think both come to God and bring offerings. offerings. Both are worshipping God, right? Why, why does God have regard for Cain's, uh, 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 sorry, for Abel's offering and not for Cain? What is, what is going on here? Well, we're going to discover that there is a difference in heart. They offer and they worship with different hearts, and we'll we'll discover that. Well, one of the one of the main rules in reading the Bible, if if there's a passage that is kind of unclear or you you a little bit puzzled, the first place you should look for an answer is the Bible itself. Very good. Not philosophy, not theories, not science. No, no, no. You first go to the Bible itself. Because if the Bible itself explains what it means, well, then you're done. Then it's God explaining it himself. Now, if we go to Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 4, what do we read there? Because it talks about this situation. Then we read that by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable, uh, acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gift. So, the difference here is, is that Abel is offering with faith, and Cain obviously not. So, Abel is going and coming to God and bringing him his offering with faith. And you could translate faith as well with trust, trust in God. So he's offering with a trust, with a kind of surrendering attitude to God. And he brings of his, and this is a hint in the text itself, he brings of his kind of first fruits, the fattest portions of his flock. Um, so he, he also gives the best. And with, uh, with Cain, he brings a offering, but we don't know if it's the best portion or if it's the leftover. Which one is it? So this, this is the difference what we see explained here in Hebrews, that Abel came with faith and Cain did not. And then we kind of see the same kind of rhetoric, the same kind of wordings when we look at the story of Abraham. Abraham trusted God and God counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham himself was not perfect. Read the story of Abraham, you'll discover, you know, he even throws his own wife for the bus. He's not perfect, but he trusts in God, even though he's sinful, and that is counted to him as righteousness. As we see here, the same to Abel. He is not perfect, but he trusts God with all his imperfections, and God counts it to him as righteousness. Now, there's another Bible verse that we need to read to shed a bit more light on this. 1 John chapter 3. It says there, and it tells us in a way, we should not be like Cain. Why not? Who was of the evil one and murdered his brother? And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So you see here a clear description that uh, uh, Cain was of the evil one. He, in, a, in a way, you see here that the evil powers are active here. He is of the evil one. So he's being influenced 
I think just two, one chapter beforehand, maybe by the serpent as well. So he's of the evil one. He does evil deeds and compared to, to Abel, who has righteous deeds. Even though Abel is still a sinful man with a sinful nature, but he, he trusts God and wants to do the righteous deeds. So, what do we see here? We see here two people, and in this instance, two brothers even, coming to worship and bring offerings to God, but they have completely different hearts. One comes with a heart with anger, with bitterness, with jealousy, with pride, with lust. You know, you can go on. So that, that, that could be one heart. Maybe you're here. Maybe you came this morning here worshiping God, but with these things in your heart. Now the other, the other, uh, uh, Abel, he came in a way with a love for God and a love for others. And the thing is, from the outside, we humans sometimes cannot see which one is the case. I cannot see, I, I cannot say like, oh yeah, you're here with a bitter heart, yeah, you're here with joy for, uh, for God and for people, and you have a, no, from the outside, we cannot sometimes see that. But God can. And God knows. Because he knows your heart. So, this is kind of the challenge, one of the challenges this morning. Before we start using the Bible, I heard this, this example. I've got a slightly Bible that, that can slightly bend. Before you use the Bible as kind of monoculars to look at others, like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, my goodness, really. You should open it up and use it as a mirror for yourself. That's that's the point. That's the message. You need to read and, and reflect on your own heart first and ask God in a way, God, please search my heart. See if there's any wrong in my heart and forgive me and guide me to you and your forgiveness. Because it's easy to now reading those two passages in the New Testament, to look back at Cain and say, Cain, 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 you are of the evil one. But oh boy, have you never come to church with anger or bitterness or jealousy in your heart? I know I have. I know that I'm not always here with a pure heart. I need to ask God again and again to make my heart pure and clean again. Now again, this, this story of Cain and Abel, the fourth chapter in the Bible, it is so foundational in how we humans work and tick and operate. Right? It, it is so close. It is, it is the longest period kind of in, uh, away in the Bible, and yet... It is so applicable and so true for today. So, let's, let's read the next few verses. Verse 5b to 7. What do we read there? So, God had, had uh, no regard for uh, Cain's offerings. So, Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? <coughs> And why has your face fallen? If you do well, um, sorry, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So the thing here is, and I find this in a way so beautiful already, Cain and Abel, they bring offerings. We read from the New Testament what, what their heart situation is. So Cain gets angry, his face falls, and he's kind of bitter, angry, upset. And yet, who's the one that shows up first? Who's the one that shows up to Cain? It's God himself. God himself, he knows his heart. God, and God could have said, all right, you're done. You know, I'm done with you. But no, God pursues him, goes to him, and kind of asks him questions to draw it out of him, to say, I, I want to challenge you because I love you, I care for you, you are part of my creation, and I want the best for you. So this is what, what's going on. But Cain, he is 
angry. And it even says he's very angry. So he's angry, he's bitter, he's upset, he's in a bad mood. And why? Well, if we read the context here, he's kind of getting, he's angry because he did not get what he thought he deserved. Now, in this context, it is in a way religious, moralistic Christian behavior. This is what's going on. Because what is Cain doing? Cain is bringing an offering to God. You know, he comes to worship to God. He goes to church. He comes to worship. He brings even stuff. So he give, even gives maybe his tithes. Or, and, and then he thinks, now I should receive your approval. Now I, now I have earned your love. And God sees his heart and says, no, 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 but that's not how I work. Because you cannot deserve my, my love for you. Because in your nature, you're sinful. I need to give you a new heart. But he gets angry. He gets religious, moralistic. Now, this is what's happening today in many Christian lives, that we have our Christian disciplines and we expect God now to love us and to have regard for us and to bless us, while God looks at the heart. And even so, and even so, if we would ask Christians in North Korea how they would feel about God's blessings while they're being persecuted and tortured, they have to go to the soul level to say, God, you bless my soul. God, I know that I'm saved with you, no matter the pain, no matter the hardship, no matter whether I live or die. So, this is amazing, right? How close it comes to our own lives, and then we are comfortable here in our Western church. So, God is kindly challenging him. Now, the challenge is that Cain has to overcome the kind of the power and the dominion of sin. This is this is the challenge that God is putting here before him. And what we see Cain doing here is he 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 does not come to repentance, say in a way, come to God and God pursuing him and say, Oh, sorry, God. Yeah, I saw you coming and I'm sorry, I've got the wrong. No, no, no. No remorse, no repentance at all. And, and the description that God then gives him, that he says, okay, if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door. Which is, this is language which means you're in a house. You're in a house and there's a wild animal out there and that wild animal is crouching on the door trying to get in to do what? Have a cup of tea? No, to grab you and to devour you. That's the, that's the picture here that we see. Sin has no mercy. Sin has no mercy. We have to defeat sin and have dominion over sin. That is, that is the challenge here that, that, that God is giving him. And sin is a wild animal. And we see this same language kind of in 1 Peter chapter 5, where it says that we have an adversary and the devil, he goes around like a roaring lion seeking to devour someone, anyone. And we have to be aware of this and we need to keep sin out of the door. So the point is, we need to rule over sin and putting it to death. I had a, a good example from an, another preacher a couple of years ago. It always stuck with me. He said, when you, when, you, when you talk about sin, if you look at sin as a lion, you know, you should not try to tame it. You should not, you should not try to make it your pet and say, no, I can handle this lion. He, he can come in and we can sit on it on the couch and do things, I'll tame it. No, no, no. That's not going to work. You need to grab this line. You need to pull it on the street. And you need to put a bullet through its head. That's that's how it stuck with me, I suppose. Um, but that's that's the call as well in the New Testament. We need to put our sin to death when we read Colossians 3, Romans chapter 8. That's the call. And God is saying, sin its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now, do we do we have some kind of recognition with this line? We saw the curse. Adam and Eve fell. What did God say to, to Eve? Your desire will be contrary to your husband. Sin is contrary to the desire of Abel. So sin is contrary and the desire of the wife will be contrary to the husband. 
and to to Abel, uh, to Cain, God says, you must rule over it. And to the wife, he says, but your husband will rule over you. The husband gets specific instructions, though, to do this with responsibility, with love, with care, right? So it's it's not a rule like, hey, I'm the boss. No, no, that's completely different. But you see here the same line. The brokenness and the fractured world comes after you, but we have to rule over that brokenness. Because this is how it was originally. Originally, when everything was very good, Cain was ruling over sin. When everything was good, the relationships and the roles between husbands and wives was perfect. Adam was leading until he failed. Adam was leading, and everything was harmon uh, um, with harmony. So this is what God is saying. This is how it is supposed to be. This is the challenge that you have now. So um, let's go to the, to the next few verses, verse 8 to 11. Because up, and, up until so far, we it's kind of all inwardly in a conversation with God, but now it comes out. Verse 8 to 11. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. One more verse. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So we see here that the difference of heart is kind of being exposed by God. And instead of repenting, Cain kills. This is what it results in. And then God again comes to Cain and asks him, Cain, where is your brother? And then he says, oh, I don't know. And then he makes even a word. Uh, he's even playing with words because then he says, am I my brother's keeper? Like, what was his brother again? He was a keeper of sheep. So he's just playing with words as well, even in a conversation to God. Well, am I my, my brother's keeper? He's a keeper of sheep. He should be able to look after himself. That, that's kind of the point and the, that... Cain is trying to make here, but he kills his brother. He kills his brother. This is what we what we see here is that instead of Cain mastering his sin, sin is mastering Cain. And worst of all, he shows no remorse. God asks him, Where is your brother? Again he had an opportunity to fall down his knees and said, God, I have sinned. God, I've made a terrible mistake, and my heart is dark. Please help me. But instead, with a cold face, I can only imagine, with, well, I don't know, while well, he did know very well, because he must, have, he must have put him somewhere, right? I don't know. Cold-blooded murder it is, and lying to God who knows everything. Now, when we look at this story as well, we need to go back to this 1 John chapter 3. We read the first verse earlier, and it says that we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. And then the next line. What's the next line? Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. See, what we see here, is that Jesus himself, um, sorry, no, John. John is using this story, and he kind of is looking at this story, and he's interpreting this story as, hey, there's one that there's a believer and there's a non-believer. They even kind of sit in the same church, possibly, you know, and, and sometimes that's not the case, but they even come to worship together. One has an evil heart, one has a righteous heart. And then... And then he, he says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. And what we see in this story is that Cain hated his brother Abel because his brother Abel was righteous, was following God with his heart, and he got hated for it. Now, what does this mean for us? 
when we follow Jesus, when we love him with our heart, when we express that in our lives, in the choices we make, in the way we talk, in the way we act, there will be people in the world that will hate you for it. And maybe it's close relatives. Maybe it's the closest person in your life. Maybe it's your colleague. Maybe it's people down the street. But we should not be surprised, brothers. Now, Abel got even killed for it, as many Christians nowadays as well. This is, this is quite something. Um, and maybe you're experiencing this in your own life at the moment, that you're being hated, that people are, in a way, persecuting you, mocking you. Maybe family relatives have maybe kind of disowned you and said, no, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm blocking you on my WhatsApp. I'm, I don't want to talk to you anymore. That hurts. That's difficult. That's sad. And at the same time, it's something that we should not be surprised about that these things might happen. But nevertheless, they hurt, don't they? Now, if we go back, then we still have to ask ourselves the question as well, is your heart, heart, is your heart, my heart, more like Cain or Abel? The Puritans had a good saying. They said, the same sun melts the ice and hardens the clay. So you can have two people, That's the, that was kind of the analogy, you can have two people, one, pe one person, when it hears the gospel, when it hears the truth, when it hears God speak, that person melts and says, oh, this is, this is wonderful, how can I follow, how, please God, make me new. And another person is like clay and the same truth and the same sun shines and you get harder and harder and more and more frustrated and more and more agitated and more and more resistant towards what God is saying and doing. See, the same sun melts the ice and hardens the clay. And if you look at, you know, if you compare New and Old Testament, you could say like Cain. Cain, he was in the, we read it even, he was in the presence of God. You know, he walked in the presence of God. And Cain is in that way almost the Judas of the Old Testament. Because Judas, he was in the presence of Jesus. He was have fellowshipping with Jesus. He had meals with Jesus. He served together with Jesus. All the while, he was plotting against Jesus. In the same way, we see here Cain being in the presence of God, worshipping, bringing heaven offerings. Hmm. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 22, because we can look at Cain and say, how can you murder? How can you murder your own brother over this? That that's that's completely out of this world. But Jesus talks about the heart and says, Well, if you have bitterness and anger in your heart, then you're kind of murdering someone else in your heart. So Jesus looks at the motivation, he looks deep what's inside. We might not come to the act because maybe we're cowards compared to Cain. But in our hearts, maybe we've murdered people. And you can murder people in different ways. You can murder them physically, but you can murder them also reputation-wise. You can murder them uh, family-wise. You know, you can completely cut them off of everything. And you're kind of murdering their life, their social life, their reputation, their opportunities. Well, that might even be worse than maybe killing someone physically. So, verse 12, because Cain did kill his brother. And what do we read from verse 12 till um, 16? Then God says to Cain, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any would who found him should attack him. Attack him. Um, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay, so here are the consequences of sin. Here are the consequences of sin. We were actually this morning kind of jokingly in the car. Don't mind if you, <laughs> if I share, but I think we all felt it. Uh, uh, my grand, uh, my uh, father and mother-in-law are spending the weekend at at our place. So we last night we went to the Wok restaurant. So it's a buffet restaurant, and I think we're all still recovering from it. Um, so you know, it's it's kind of uh, the consequences of sin, eating too much. You have to bear them. You can't, in a way, escape them. You you cannot say like, "Please, Lord, help me to to feel better." While you just we just stuffed our faces, you know that that's not how it works. Uh, we had a wonderful time, by the way. But uh, uh, so the consequences of sin they will be there, and they are there. We feel them as well in our lives, in sickness, in disappointments, in irritations, in the fact that we all die. Now Cain got uh, alienated, uh, alienated from from the ground and from God. So God said, "Okay, you know, I have to push you now away, just like He did with Adam and Eve from Eden." Now, the interesting thing is, is that now for the first time in this story, we see that Cain shows remorse. See, the th interesting thing is, Cain now has to face the consequences of his sin. And now he feels sorry, because now it starts to hurt. Now it has effect on his life. So he 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 suddenly like yeah, but I I can't bear this. Well, you killed your brother. How do you mean you can't bear this? In a way. Now th this is something that that shows up in our lives, I think, regularly as well. We have remorse and we and we in a way complain and feel sad about the consequences of sin. But do we also confess the guilt of our sin? Because that's a massive difference. That's a massive difference. But this is what we see here. And then yet, and again, we see God's kindness coming through because he here are the consequences. Cain says, But I can't bear this. This is too much for me. And then and then God says, you know, but he's afraid that that people out there will kill him. And God says, "No, not so. I'll protect you. I'll even put a mark on you, and no one will be able to to kill you because then revenge will be sevenfold, and from me myself." Wow. That is kindness on God's behalf again. So, um, where are we? I'm going faster with one side than the other. Now let's 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 read the next verses. So I think the the point here is is at what point are you confessing your sins to God? And are you confessing your sins to God or are you complaining about the consequences of your sin to God? How is that in your life? How is that shaped in 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 your prayer life? Now now we get an in interesting thing as well in the next verses, verse 17 till 24. Cain, the conti story continues, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehajuel, and Mehajuel fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives, the name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah, and Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. So much for evolution theory. Uh, the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and, Z and Zillah, hear my voice. Your, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. 
If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Okay, so we see here a lineage going through from Canaan and then Father and Father, and then we come to Lamech, and here we see cultural kind of development and moral devolution. So you see here the cultural and technology developments in the lineages and in the sons, animal breeding, music, metal work, we see that all in huge development. But Lamech, then we come to Lamech. Now Lamech, he is going to display it for us all what human pride and arrogancy looks like. First of all, he takes two wives. He goes in rebellion to how God has instituted it in chapter 1 and 2. He takes two wives, and then he starts bragging to his two wives. Because, you know, he even the way he, he, he does it, because he, uh, Lamech said to his wives, uh, Ada and Zillah, and then, you know, you, you can see him almost say, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. You watch, you know, and I uh, I have killed a man uh, who wounded me, a, a young man for striking me. Because you know, if if uh, Cain's revenge by God is sevenfold, now mine is going to be seventy times seventy. In other words, God's protection for uh, for Cain, nice and solid, but I'm going to do it seventy times seventy. He is just boasting about his own power and his own protection mechanisms. I can look after myself 70 times, 70 volts, and it will be vengeance. So whoever will try to do something to me. And it is so contrary to what we read in the New Testament. What, the, what did Jesus say about 70 times 70? To forgive. So Jesus reverses it and he says, no, 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 no. I'm asking you to forgive 70 times 70. So he, he displays here arrogancy, human pride, and moral devolution instead of evolution. So then um, the beautiful thing where it's going to, to end with, the last couple of verses, what do we read? Verse 24, 25. So I got the wrong references under the under this. But it's verse 24, 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enos. And at that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Those last two verses show you've got people killing each other, yet God continues his faithful plan. God kind of deals with it and then moves on because he has a plan for salvation. Number one, there's new birth. There's fresh hope. There's fresh hope. And it's kind of underlined by the notion that from that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So people began to worship God, to call upon his name. And if we go to Luke chapter 3 in the New Testament, we see that Jesus indeed comes from the lineage of Seth. Well, he had to come from the lineage of Adam and Eve, of course. But we see it is mentioned and is noted there that, okay, there's new birth. Something terrible happened again. New birth, fresh hope. And God continues with his plan to eventually send his own son, Jesus to die for us, to sacrifice himself for us with the promise that when Jesus comes back, what will he do? He will make everything new again. Now that promise, that promise which has been put in motion here again and kind of been underlined again, that is what we can hold on to because that is hope, that is life, that is a future if you belong to God, if you are a child of his. And that requires you to be an Abel and not a Cain. But that requirement cannot be earned. 
You cannot do anything. You cannot bring offerings to earn that like Cain tried. The only thing it requires is humility. To come with a humble heart to Jesus and say, Jesus, please, I'm a sinful person. Please forgive me. Please let your sacrifice also have been for me. And the guarantee, the promises that there will be forgiveness no matter what you have done, no matter how you feel, there will be forgiveness, there will be a filling of the Holy Spirit, and there will be this hope and this new life and joy in your soul. And I wish that for every single person here. Let us pray, and then we're going to sing uh, together again. Heavenly Father, as we read through these Bible books, and if we read through Genesis, Father, then we, then we are in awe of your creation, of your greatness. And Father, then we are in a way sad of the brokenness of the world and sad about the brokenness of our own lives, sad about our own sinful nature. And Father, then we pray and ask you, please, will you intervene in our lives? We come to you we want to repent and tell you that we are sorry, that we are rebelling against you, not honoring you the way we should, that we are not following you the way we should. But Father, we ask you and we plead with you, will you forgive us? Will you cleanse us? Will you forgive us? So that we can receive new life, this new birth, and that we can receive the hope that you have for the future. Father, I pray for each and every person here. Father, I don't know if there's hearts of Cain or hearts of Abel. You know, Father. And I pray that you will work it out in each and every one's heart in such a way that we will come to you and that we will become Abel's and that you will declare us righteous because of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. I pray this and I praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.